Everyone will be up here in just a moment. Those of you who were at the last presentation heard me mention the 1L6s, two good 1L6s. I figured out what to do with them. It's not what you thought. They are going to be in the um, door prizes tonight at the banquet. Based on you, the ticket, the, the number of your banquet ticket, we have a drawing, and you get to go up to the table and choose whatever you like. There's books and other kinds of things that show up tonight. There'll be two 1L6s showing up as free gifts for whoever gets drawn at the banquet. And tickets are still available out in front. So uh, the theme for this year was actually the theme we established for two years ago, 100 years of broadcasting. And uh, Bill Goodwin's going to take history back even a little farther than that and talk about a very powerful uh, couple, Frank and Hester Chambers, who were in manufacturing equipment and other kinds of things in Philadelphia, way back at the beginning of the 20th century. So Bill, take it away. Glad to see you all. Thank you for coming. Tie the knot near it. Wait. Yep. Have to hold it this close or closer? Close. This close? There you go. That sounds better. Okay. I'll, I'll use the slides to try to prompt me so you don't have to worry about trying to read them. It seemed to be working before. I know it's working now. Because I can hear it. Um, slides are mostly for triggering me, but there are a couple longish ones which violates AV policy of having only, only no more than seven lines. But you'll see why I, I put full sentences on some of them. You want to kick the next slide? You know, the themes that will run throughout is, uh, as all of you may have experienced, acquisition spurs interest, mystery, and they kind of then chase each other. And as you dig deeper, little details emerge. And in the history of radio, uh, nothing occurred in a vacuum intellectually. So for me, going through this, um, all of those elements proved true. Would you go to the next one? I'll just say slide. So for many of us, we grew up with it or we were employed in the field. Um, for me, I'm a history buff, so I get a focus on the person in the story. Perhaps you do too. Certainly, we heard that with the personality, uh, in effect, of the companies, as Paul was talking in the earlier presentation. Um, some get involved because they like the appearance of the radios, the designers, that sort of thing. Slide, please. So for me, uh, it started probably in the middle 90s when I found a particular device at a field auction. And uh, one of my careers, the last one, uh, was as a social worker. And social workers, in dealing with people, focus on them in their environment, all the influences on a person and how they can navigate those and what is needed to help them. And so the picture kind of represents that. None of us lives fully in isolation. And you'll see that that was true of the Chambers couple. Slide, please. These are my major references. AWA review article in uh, review number two. Ludwell Sibley had a couple articles um, that helped point me in a couple directions. Uh, hundreds of newspaper articles and trade magazines, Ancestry.com, Wikipedia. Next slide. Um, for a long while, I knew of Chambers only as F.B. Chambers and Company, but I did, did dig out his full name. So it's Frank Brosius Chambers, born in 1879 in Norristown, Pennsylvania, eldest of six. And I put the uh, uh, genders of the, or yeah, son, son, 
daughter, 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 son, um, because the second one, his brother ended up working with him for a while, and the last one's carpenter because that son followed in the father's footsteps directly, but the carpentry background, I think, played a significant role in what Chambers did later. And the last point, he got married in 1905. Next slide. These are a very abbreviated uh, family tree. And what struck me was kind of interesting sociologically is look at the ages of his father versus his mother. You know, she's six years older and 10 years difference between Frank and his wife, Hester. And uh, I had long heard how um, women mature well before uh, men, and maybe it's the wise man who marries an older woman. But uh, apparently, you know, these were very long-lived uh, marriages. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting thing. And note little Raymond there, born in 1906. And though I put 1920, that's wrong, and we'll see a little bit later. Next slide. All right, she was born Hester Rulon Erickson in Chesterfield, New Jersey, second of five children, a dressmaker. And their background, uh, family history for multiple generations were laborers and the women were homemakers. And there was a strong statement in one of the articles, uh, apparently it's family lore, where they had John Erickson, who was a marine inventor, in their family. And he's best known for most people historically as inventing and designing the monitor in the monitor in Merrimack in the Civil War and the screw peller. And so notable a person was he that there's his monument in D.C. I think it's near the river, a tidal basin perhaps, given the background and what I think I remember. <clears throat> Next slide. All right, there are a couple of stories. It's a little bit of an er overview. Um, with his background, he said he was in telegraph operations and uh, was educated in Drexel Institute in the name they had there, you see, Art, Science, and Industry. And I claim, and it seems proven by the facts, that he moved amateur radio industry forward, which really spurred the development of what we know now as uh, broadcast radio for the masses. Um, he affected the legislation, um, and they'll get you more into the loving partnership and their family tragedy. Next slide. <coughs> So it's my best effort at a timeline. Here's wireless communications use, and I'll focus most of the story on the green there with some references to the other portions of the timeline. Next slide. A little history you all know about Hertz. Uh, and of course, he just demonstrated what others had predicted through math and physics. And a lot of this stuff was in the intellectual atmosphere during uh, Frank's uh, young adulthood, having been born in uh, 1879. So he was coming of age right when that stuff was really pumping out. And I remember seeing in a period of the uh, real early 1900s, late 1800s, just in the Philadelphia papers, there was a thousand references to wireless. So that would have been just swirling around in his uh, mind. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, Marconi I put up there because I found one little interesting tidbit. The, you can see on this bottom inset, that's England, British Isles, I guess, right, with Wales down there. And in the center of that arrow's point um, is the island from which he broadcasted to the shore. Uh, six kilometers across the channel. So it gives you, for me, it gave me a pictorial representation of why he thought he could do the Atlantic uh, crossing at the frequencies and time of the day that he did or might have. Next slide. Um, how many of you all have heard the wireless referred to as man-made lightning, the spark transmitter? Uh, does anybody know the origin? Because I know one person I interviewed who spoke it the first time I heard it. Uh, you know Stokes who wrote the book on vacuum tubes? I happened to interview him in New Zealand back, oh, I guess it was 1990. And he was the first I ever heard talk about it. And he talked about it with real affinity as though it was a natural intellectual growth, you know, kind of on the 
line of divinely inspired to duplicate nature and then to try to modify it and shape it to where it becomes even more useful. And you could think of it maybe as I was impressed by one of the lectures that uh, Ed Lyon gave when talking about uh, propagation, ionosphere, sunspots, and then he went on to say how that influenced tree growth and the particular woods produced in that period was what they used for Stradivarius violins. Um, so when Stokes told me about the uh, man-made lightning, you know, it struck me with that same kind of romance and depth of background. Um, the next point, Fezzard in there, he wrote um, an analysis that I quote at the bottom there, that receiver development is critical to the communication system because they could, with brute force, create sparks and create waves, radio waves that would go great distances, but how to detect them, how to make it sensitive, how to tune, all those things became critical to uh, the industry, the science moving forward. Next slide, please. And to give you some idea of where things were, the amateurs you can see, frequency and wavelength, the wavelength had to be greater than 200 meters, but that was because it was forced on them. I think it was the Radio Act 1912 that did that. It pushed them out of all these other areas because uh, they were haphazardly screwing up and messing with the uh, commercial and military traffic. And uh, that's what, in part, was spurring the government to uh, wipe out amateur use, as will be mentioned later. Ships were in the ranges you see there. The Navy, in particular, used the longest waves for the greatest distance. The ships are a reference to commercial ships. And then land stations, trans, uh, transoceanic. And it's important to note the uh, lowest wavelength meters there because that's where uh, the range of Franks uh, at, at the upper range in terms of wavelength, lower range in terms of frequency that his equipment was set for. Next slide. All right, his professional background, this is what he gave in congressional testimony in 1918, that he had been employed in, in these industries, which I represent a little graphically. And he said he had held positions of foreman, superintendent, and wire chief, and I didn't list the obvious, radio manufacturer and experimenter. Next slide. Um, their courtship and partnership, um, it was because of his work in the telegraph business, he was in Trenton and he went to a Masonic ball and uh, there's a reference to the Masons that comes up um, at the very end. But it was there that he saw, first saw Hester and he saw her from the back and liked what he saw from the back. Um, <laughs> And the reporter, in talking to him, uh, in doing the interview from which this article and these points are brought out, described her as tall and willowy, with fine hair, keen eyes, and wins a respect the ball. So you hear a little bit of chauvinism, but the respect portion maybe makes things a, a little more human, a little more uh, appropriate. But it gave me some thought, well, she must have done wonderful stuff with her hair for him to want to approach her and give, get an introduction early on. So they got married in 1905 in February. And uh, she said, independently of him, that uh, he's a wireless enthusiast of the most intense kind. And he would not enjoy it unless I was involved too. Next slide. And in the article in 1916, um, they were referred to colloquially in the radio world as Mr. and Mrs. NR, and that they were inseparable. Well, back in the early days, uh, amateurs who applied for license were able to choose the letters of their name, and he chose NR for Norristown, and they became known as Mr. and Mrs. NR. Um, I didn't include here, but um, you've heard of the Wizard of Menlo Park for Edison, and he was a wizard of whatever street he was on, which I thought was kind of a reputation on Doff of the Hat to how uh, strongly he was influencing the wireless group, at least in Philadelphia. So he credited his wife, uh, whom he wouldn't have gotten into business without her, uh, as helping to manufacture the instruments, uh, and she tested everything they put out uh, in their experiments on 3XC. And uh, she, especially in the earliest days, referring to the, they would hold the uh, 
Pennsylvania Wireless Association meetings at their home and sometimes elsewhere, and she was always there, and that um, she held her own and was well regarded in those circles too. Um, this last item is particularly keen because of a later reference. Both were, quote, and this is in the article, passionately fond of children, although they have none of their own in 1916. And you saw that uh, family chart that showed in 1910 they had a four-year-old child. 1916, they don't. Chats with, they chat with up to 10, quote, kitties in an evening with their little peepy -pee sparks which come out of the darkness like a little child voice. That's from Hester. Um, so I'm thinking, son, we're not seeing him anymore. Passionate about little kids, little peepee -pee sparks like voices of children. Next slide. So his summary of the uh, relationship, Hester is always with the men. When we go to other homes, we never see their wives. I don't think that's right. A man and his wife should always have an intense interest in others' affairs, each other's, keeps them loving each other, and they've never had a scrap in 14 years, and we always do everything together. I, I don't know that everybody would agree they could, should do that, but it's really heartwarming to me to, to hear that they had that kind of relationship. Next slide. Picture of where they were at their marriage and where they set up their, as I would call it, cottage industry. There's only the three of them listed there, Frank, Hester, and their son, Raymond. Next slide. In 1920, they moved to Arch Street, and unlike the other picture, which was the original building, they've obviously built something else on the site where they used to be, because this looks like a modern open-air school building of, or something like that, a big office with open floor plan. Also working with them uh, is Herbert, his brother. He was listed as an electrician and engineer. He was listed as a, Frank was as the employer, and Mr. Casper as a draftsman proofreader, and uh, Raymond is gone. This slide I uh, made without reflecting on the fact that by 1916, Raymond's gone. Because you know, the reporter said apparently they had no other children, so he died between four and six years old. Next slide. Uh, the, these are the, just the timeline of when they were at the different addresses because uh, the first article I wrote on them was trying to give a, an idea of the evolution uh, technologically relationship and location-wise of where they were. So the last um, bigger picture shows how they had this uh, corner area for their store slash shop and the next entrance, 6102, led to their uh, apartment above the the commercial space. Next slide. So here are the pictures of Hester. She was uh, widely cited in articles um, working her operate, uh, operating her uh, wireless station. And um, he's shown working his, quote, portable receiver. And he has earphones on, which you might just barely see with that line going up his jacket to his head. And, I guess the hat's there for show because he couldn't wear it and use the headphones too. Next slide. Their enthusiasm started really early. Here's Hester's quotes um, talking about how when he was out on business trips, uh, they would keep in touch her talking to him and he could only listen. And she said, these mutual talks are interesting, but I have the greatest fun when I get him with his portable receiver and can do all the talking myself without well, his being able to reply with the word. The fun is not lessened by my knowledge of the fact that every wireless operator in the radius is in on the conversation and hears just what I'm saying to my husband. Uh, and one of the things he said too is uh, he would get teased when he would go um, to somebody's house among the wireless operators that he knew to be able to reply back to her. But in the meantime, as she's calling out, talk to him, they'd be putting out, Mr. N.R., where are you? Where are you? Looking for you. Your wife wants you. Your wife wants you. So, you know, like a bunch of us when we were 14, teasing one another, they were doing it on the air to him. And again, a reference to uh, children. We sometimes have a dozen boys talking to us and to one another. Uh, I should say, we'll give them all an invitation to come in and, and by and by one will call, make himself known, talk wireless until going home time. 
And that was in 1910, both of those. So you know, that's really early with them having gotten married in 1905 and the catalog that uh, Ludwell Sibley, I think, had, or at least somebody's catalog, uh, said they started making radio equipment in 1905. Next slide. All right, everything was aimed at amateur use because there wasn't anything. Um, I've um, reproduced a catalog for you. And there's copies up here. Hope you take so it won't be wasted. Uh, and I'll show you some of what was in the catalog or real life. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, the first aids I've, uh, ads I found, every one of them mentions catalog. And the first one is up there, the little four-liner. They're selling parts. And they have a catalog. It costs two cents to get the catalog. Um, 1913, he's selling wireless and parts. 1915, this first ad in QST is for a rotary gap spark setup. Rotary spark gap. And inductive tuner. And next slide. This is an example of uh, a rudimentary system for spark stations. And it matches perfectly from his catalog of what items he recommended that matched this particular uh, schematic, pictorial schematic. Next slide. This is a drawing from his uh, catalog. So Frank uh, has, I think, eight or so technical drawings, schematics of things. And his recommended setup, one of them, uh, for a receiving station using a tuning coil, condenser of either type, detector stands, uh, variable condenser, and receivers, which we call headphones and claims you could easily read the signal from 2,000 miles distant. I would wonder. Was that, was that the device he was wearing in that previous slide with the headset? And it, he, had, he had something that looked like a variable inductor on yeah, his chest. It's similar, um, but um, in the old equipment contest, I have uh, a number of items. Uh, and you'll see the tuning coil. And you can imagine it, it. What's primarily different from what I have and what was in here is he had a crystal on it, and, and he, he oriented vertically across his chest versus laterally that you'll see in there. Next slide. So he sold spark equipment, a straight helix coil, and a transformer. Ed, uh, would you think that's a two-to-one transformer? Uh, looks looks like that to me. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. Which would probably make it less than that ratio. Yeah. Uh, rotary gap. Next slide. Uh, this I think photo comes from the Antique Wireless Association uh, Museum. Next slide. Oh, go back one slide, would you? Preview. And just. Yeah, and just look down by the <coughs> fingerboard there. You can see one of the ways in which he marked his equipment. Most of them, especially wood, there's a stamp in the wood. Uh, some metal products had an etching but here or engraving. But here you see there's a full plate. Next slide. One antenna switch. And next slide. Much better looking one. And I uh, blew up the areas to show you that he stamped the metal and engraved the, uh, I guess, hard rubber on the upper right. Next slide. A fixed glass condenser. And uh, what I th note here is most of the systems only went up to, uh, his materials only went up to one kilowatt, probably because that's what was uh, the limit at some point. And depending on how big a, a system you're working, it cost anywhere from eight to $64 back then. I think even my father's time in the 20s, a loaf of bread cost five cents. So that was some big money. And if you wanted the box in mahogany, you had to add $2 for every quarter kilowatt up. Next slide. Uh, again, there's the uh, slightly different uh, chambers uh, stamp on that. And I suspect that um, this sort of stuff he bought from others, uh, like a lot of jobbers did. Next slide. Um, 
This is a jeweler set. It's probably the premier set that he put out, although he did put out uh, several other receiving sets. Um, anybody know why they would have called it a jeweler set? We're talking 1910. Right, right. So they, they needed a time signal to get standard set, and that was pretty critical. I guess uh, the government was prompted to do it, if I recall correctly, to help all the industries, especially the railroad industry, to keep schedules right. And so he has, uh, you know, in that open drawer, you'll see, um, you'll see a version of this cover. You know, it was gray with green lettering, and I was in the process of reproducing that. And I did find one online, but it was just a, a blurry picture. But it's neat to see that it documented through this photo. This is in the uh, Stone collection. Uh, I had permission from him to uh, reproduce it for the article I wrote for AWA. Next slide. So this is the most advertised couplers, 748, which I have in the old equipment contest. I have a 746. This is a, the bigger one is a 749. Um, the 748, you'll see in a moment. Um, but this is the ad which first mentions um, to have a chamber's circuit. And that was important to me because uh, I was trying to, through all the reference, determine whether or not he was in fact an engineer or was he a businessman or salesman or how did all those hats fit and when in his career. Next slide. So here's the 746 that I have in the next room. It's, uh, it's described as being 23 inches, um, but apparently the base is varied a bit. Mine's 21 inches. Next slide. Again in the next room is the 748, and I would hazard that those wires were added because it's of course not shown in the ad, although they do look period for the kind of cloth they're on there, so it's a little bit of a mystery there for me to unwrap. Because ordinarily, the, the, uh, you would hook um, a wire for your circuit elsewhere, and there'd be conduction from the binding post into the rod to the little uh, scraper that's touching the coil. And uh, I would point out how you can see that it's uh, stamped in the wood there. Next slide. So a uh, tuning coil, this is uh, what I would say is very close to what he had on his chest. And he would have just had a, a base board and it had then the crystal on that extra extension of the base board. Next slide. And there is the coil and I have it in the next room. And it's uh, overall 13 and a half. It's exactly to the measure you said because he talked about having three quarter inch ends and a coil length of uh, 12 inches. The only thing that didn't hold its shape was the, uh, the dimensions of the, uh, the, what do you call it, cylinder on which the coil was mentioned. And the fellow I got it from said how the uh, windings had loosened and he tightened them up. Well, it looks like a mess because all of the scraped areas and then there's loose windings and it, would have changed the value of the inductance, all of that stuff. But I'm still glad to have it. Next slide. So you can get a little sense then of how the two differ and see how it looks. He's got the crystal at the top. So it's that picture inverted uh, 90 degrees and <coughs> vertical. And he is working the controls. And this is from a, an article and is uh, copied here, right side facing. Next slide. This is, I think, unique. I've certainly never heard and never saw any others, but Chambers has his name stamped in Brandis uh, earphones. And uh, obviously he would have bought it from them, but putting his name on it. Um, this may be the only example known. I've never heard of any other, and it has a, a much better leather strap. I have a book uh, catalog of Brandis stuff in the box over there, but I didn't see any headband 
that had leather on both sides of the metal wide band. You usually just see two arched connectors to the earphone pieces. Next slide. I brought this up because these are from um, the catalog and they're entitled Ericsson. Uh, in my family background, uh, great-grandparents were named Doherty and there must be 25 ways of saying Doherty. Doherty, do, like bread Doherty or D-O-H-E-R-T-Y -E and how many ways are there to spell and pronounce Ericsson over there? So um, this, could her family's name be involved with this guy? It's in their catalog, but who knows? Just a little thing, but there's the detector stand and he talked about it being uh, enclosed. It's not sealed, but it would be enclosed, so it'd be more rugged against being bumped, presumably and no dust would get in it, which is what his article claimed. Next slide. All right, there's a reference um, to them as Mr. and Mrs. NR, and I brought this up because of their multiple spheres that they both worked in. At the Philadelphia, it was the wireless work. At the state, uh, he was a principal in starting the Pennsylvania Wireless Association. He ran the experimental wireless station at those different frequencies. And the last one, I mean, the first two, 300, 400, it was when he was on Arch Street. And the last one at 480 uh, meters was when he was at uh, Market Street. And that was you know, in the late teens to early 20s. At the national effort um, or level, he was very strong and got agreement from uh, the House of Representatives Committee uh, to help the amateurs and their claims against the Navy pressure. And in that time, he represented the wireless associations of Pennsylvania, Mississippi Valley, and Colorado. He also represented St. Martin's College way out in the state of Washington, and the amateurs of the 13th Naval District in Puget Sound. Where is Puget Sound? Isn't that out that's west? Yeah, it's yeah. Washington State. Yeah, I thought so. so his reputation got around. He also offered prizes in, um, of his equipment in um, radio relays with AARL. Uh, he'd written some articles. And he had a, apparently an engaging way of dealing with a congressman and talking about how the Navy was trying to silence the, uh, the amateurs, you know, getting them out of it. And he, he had a word picture of uh, a chicken roosting and a screech owl roosting. And a screech owl, of course, is real quiet all day long, all day long. And the uh, chicken was there lording it over the screech owl because the screech owl is only about this big and chicken is about this big and chicken was the Navy. And the screech owl would just bit by bit move closer to the chicken and the chicken would keep moving further. And you think the story is going to go that he falls off the branch, but no, just as it gets dark, the screech owl makes his voice known. And in the example here, uh, Chambers was being the voice of the amateurs to get the uh, Congress to allow them to continue operating. Because after the war, they wanted to, the Navy just wanted to do it all, uh, get all the amateurs out, keep all the wavelengths to themselves, at least as the writing that I've read go. Next slide. All right, again, is he a businessman, an engineer? Well, I've got all these different drawings. These are only two of the three pages in the book that's available to you folks. Um, next slide. Um, on the far right is one of his uh, circuits, just because it has his initials, so it's the only example I have of probably how he, his handwriting was. And Hazeltine, in his book in 1918, his proceedings uh, to the Institute of Rage of Engineers on oscillating audio circuits, he modified um, one of uh, chamber circuits and reproduced it here. So there's you know, some proof that he had some knowledge of uh, the deeper electronics, but uh, I still think he was probably going more businessman. Next page. Um, he tried to branch out, I think. He, he had some ads that said dealers wanted, and here was a dealer of 
Merker Flocker, and I reproduced the devices he had. And you may remember seeing the uh, glass condenser, the antenna switch, and the 749 or uh, 748 loose coupler. And um, I put that second ad there. They were actually, it was underneath this one in the uh, Modern Electrics page, but I put it up there top just to make it easier to read now. But you see just by the nature of the equipment and the proximity of the ads that they were connected. Next slide. All right, so in the post-war, I see him as going from manufacturing more and more into sales. But even in this 1922-23 uh, uh, city directory, they're focused on telegraphy at the Chambers Institute. Um, but he's also was doing uh, equipment sales. Um, one of the other ads says wireless apparatus sales is what he says in some of them. Next slide. Um, why I say that I think he went to radio sales only was because of an article that referenced uh, Atwater Kent Manufacturing Company calling a meeting trying to organize uh, people in the industry um, where he wanted them to um, be a better uh, commercial voice in the city. And towards that end, to get people to attend, they had a contest for uh, display, window displays. You know, most of us are old enough to know that department stores had big decorated windows displays to bring people in. And so to encourage uh, really nice stuff, they had a contest. I don't know what the prize was, but Chambers won one of the awards. And, and they were mostly non-radio business, but he was, because of his business, trying to get all the radio people in to join. There was no follow-up article I could find out what the results were, but this was in 1926, and my belief was they were pretty much out of the uh, anything wireless. Maybe they would have been doing parts, uh, but I would say they were probably doing uh, primarily household radios. Next slide. So Frank died at 68 in 1947, did find his death certificate arteriosclerosis complicating his uh, heart attack. With Chester, uh, Hester, she died um, a couple years later at 79. No cause was given in the article I read, and she was resigning at the Masonic Home in Elizabethtown. So I would say that perhaps he uh, kept up a Masonic uh, membership, um, but uh, found it uh, nice that she had that kind of care at the end of her life. Next slide. So the conclusions, in his congressional testimony, he says he was an electrical and radio engineer. He did operate the experimental radio station for quite some years. He was prominent locally, regionally, nationally in advance of civilian or amateur use of radio, which he maintained in those um, testimonies was a key to scientific development. He said, if you took away anything that the amateurs then had, it was a disincentive, maybe death now to scientific development. And I think we would all agree, you have much more energy if you have many more people involved and, and they're enjoying it, spurring one another on. So I think he was dead right. So his electrical engineer, by his statement, whose wireless enthusiasm led him to radio manufacturing and part sales, then developed the telegra telegraphy school and household radio sales. And that's, I felt, because the nature of the industry changed. Tubes came out, and I don't think he had the, the background that allowed him to do much in that arena. That's just the conclusions I'm getting. Next slide. With Hester, she was an ardent wireless operator in 19, from 1905 on. She was the first woman licensed operator in, this, in the country in 1913. She was then the first licensed instructor in 1918. And her story was carried far and wide in the, in the publications I saw, Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Jersey, Kansas, California, just some of the uh, places she was, uh, her story was written up. 
She was in the manufacturing process and active in experiment, experimenting, and she operated a retail radio apparatus and household set sales. And I would assume helped with the part sales that are well detailed in the uh, in the manuals. I mean, in this book that's available to you all. Next slide. As a couple, they were quite obviously devoted to one another. Uh, you know, I've known of some families who've uh, found the loss of a child devastating, especially if you can imagine a couple's only child. But uh, they just seem to strengthen their relationship as time went on. Uh, they were particularly supportive, as you've heard, of child wire wireless operators. They jointly pursued it, wireless and its advancements, and they poured their wireless interest into a business on an equal basis, as I read things. Next slide. And there they are in 1910. The uh, focus of the article was a weird antenna for reception, so he was attaching to bed springs, antennas, uh, clotheslines, whatnot. And the article talked about how a kid at camp could hook up their receiving set and still see what was going on in the wireless world. And that's, that's the conclusion of the paired remarks. I didn't see where I was going on time. How are we doing? Um, anything else you might want to know that I could uh, respond to? I appreciate the questions that you have brought up. Well, if you would, please take the books, because what I'm hopeful is nothing, if nothing else, you get familiar with what was put out there. And if you see it, give me a call. I'd love to get some more. So you can buy something without fear of being stuck with it for the most part, unless you get up to a thousand bucks or something. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Uh, Thank you. Was, was wireless at the time uh, essentially AM modulated voice, uh, or, or when they talked about wireless, did they do CW operation, or did kids get into CW, or what was it? And how early do you, are you familiar with any, any radio telephony? I think there was some real early, wasn't there? Yeah, and the, the, well, there was first there was the high speed rotary arcs with the like 10 kilohertz uh, rotary arcs that they used to make the first voice transmission. Right. Like, it was pretty garbage. And then in the early Edwardian era, they went to pulse arcs, which was the very first right. steady continuous wave. And that's really when uh, telephony took off. Yeah. And then after that, tubes replaced the pulse arcs. Yeah. But into, like, Yeah, yeah. I think there was the teeniest efforts in the middle 19 teens. That's my best semi guess for some some voice. But like you said, it was garbage until you could get higher frequencies. And um, what frequencies did the Alexanderson stuff go? Because that was. Yeah, and I think the last one just quit operating in the last five years. Oh no, the uh, the wireless no, with little sparks. Hell, even when I was a kid at uh, fourteen. There was, uh, I think, Boy's Life talked about getting a, a little buzzer yeah. and transmitting through the ground. And I had a friend who lived about six houses away, and that's what we wanted to do is be able to, you know, catch that little buzzer through ground loop. Just, yes? The, uh, the man I was talking about in the next presentation, he was a, uh, started out as a child, went to the Marconi School and went to C, which was if you had a serious interest as a kid, that was the chain of events. You went mm -hmm. to school and you became a ship driver. Yeah, and, and all the articles talked similarly. And um, there was an article written in 1917 that quoted the Chambers people about um, 
how proficient she was and that she was the licensed instructor and they were turning out people like crazy and that the amateurs of the country were ready to serve the nation in its time of need. And it happened in both world wars that it was amateurs who were brought in right away. If you had a, a skill needed by the military in a fast call up, as I'm thinking of my father, he had been in clerical work and knew how to type and he was brought in in World War II as an E3. And he got out of the Navy four years later as a chief petty officer. I mean, you know, skills is, is what they need in war and, and amateurs brought that in. I could imagine a lot of amateurs going in above, you know, recruit. Yes? Did you see anything in your research about like how many uh, loose couplers they might have made compared no. to like Yeah. Ten of those to every one of the chambers? Or? Oh, I've only seen uh, out in the wild, as opposed to one eBay, I've only seen uh, two chambers things, and I've been looking for a while. I, I don't get out that much, but even on eBay, right now there's a one 36-inch one, 36-inch one for, uh, he wants 1200 he offered it to be before he went on eBay for 1100 you know, and I figured I'm too close to death to have my family <laughs> sell it. I need the, the, the one with the two, two things that I have one on that has actually one, one slide on the top. Ah. So they made at least three different ones. Is it oh, yeah. One? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a... I mean, I, couplers come up. Uh, I've seen them several times in radio activities. I've seen several at once in radio activities. I've seen loose couplers. Right. Yeah, I was looking to see if in the catalog they have a, a single slide. I've seen them in ads. I have not seen them in real life. I don't think they were in catalogs, no. And when you get it, you'll see that on the left side is the catalog as originally produced. On the right is the same page where I inserted the color photo. You know, the more stuff I get, the more I'll put out there so that people can really see in the future what the uh, real ones look like as opposed to the old catalog. Yes? And manufacturing never got past like the factory? It was always their store? No. Um, in his testimony in 1918, he talked about having a small shop. He made things by hand, small tools. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what living in capital and space and then the changing uh, uh, technology and certainly uh, the war shut down everybody. So would these have been built to order or would they have been like, would he kept at any sort of stock? I don't know. Um, I would have thought he had a lot of stock for uh, small parts, um, but he could have made it to order just to guess, I don't know how many came in at a time. I mean, in the early days, it was just the three of them. Yes. These coils are pretty big. They probably had a self resonant frequency that was tens or hundreds of kilohertz. Yeah. Do you know if they still used external tuning condensers or did they rely on the self resonant frequency? They, they, uh, the recommended um, designs he had for receivers had uh, fixed and um, variable condensers. Of course, that was the word back then versus capacitors, as we would say. Um, Their time receiver was for NAA, and that was on about uh, 12, 1,300 kilohertz. Right. And, uh, so there was a, an associated tuning capacitor. Right. I was looking here. Uh, you know, here's a receiver on the far right, transmitter on the far left, and there's two tuning capacitors there. And uh, across the headphones is a fixed capacitor and a detector on this far right. So, yeah, pick it up. I made 40 copies. I don't want to take them all home.
the more you all take, the more chance I have of getting something. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>